locked in to the hottest station on the planet. Resistance is futile. The revolution has begun. You're listening to Rebelpreneur Radio, helping you break the rules and build the business you need for the life you want. And now, broadcasting his pirate signal from somewhere beyond the status quo, here's your host, best-selling author, marketing and media strategist, Ralph Brogdon. Hello and welcome to Rebelpreneur Radio, the show that helps you build the business you need so you can live the life you want. I am Ralph Brogdon. Well, how do we get ourselves to do the things that we know that we want to do? We want to do stuff. We know we should do stuff like building a great business, living a great life. But there's something sometimes it seems to block us and prevent us from doing what we're truly a truly capable of. And today's guest is going to help us break that down and explain to us why that is. I'm speaking with Chris Babson. He is an author, a speaker on the topics of leadership and peak performance at UCLA and as as, as well as the corporate market. So he's really got some some fascinating things to share with us that's going to help us with our performance as well as being more effective leaders. So Chris Babson, welcome to Rebelpreneur Radio. Hey, Ralph. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Now, you have been a Fortune 5 vice president working with Jack Welch at, at GE. You've been developing alliances with Fortune 2000 CFOs in the $5 million to $500 million range. So you have been in an environment of peak performance and and really practicing what you preach and putting all of this stuff into practice in a big way. Uh, but your story doesn't start there. Your story actually goes back a few years. So tell us a little bit more about um, how you got to the place that you're at and, and tell us a little bit about that journey. Okay. Uh, I I guess uh, I'm fortunate that I have an inner drive to, to grow and, and better myself and my lot in life. I left home when I was 14. I grew up in a very abusive family, both physically and as, as terrible as that is, the emotional abuse was even worse. My, my father took, uh, uh, spared no moment to let us know that we were uh, subhuman, uh, worthless, and uh, worthy only of a foul word and a, a fist across the face. Mm. So I left home when I was 14 with the family abuse problems and uh, personal serious drug use problems also and dropped out of high school. Um, went for, uh, I think it was about a year to a drug clinic. I did go back to high school. I graduated dead last out of a 326 kids, directionless, competenceless, and no life skills whatsoever. Uh, accidentally d- discovered, uh, well, I didn't accidentally discover, uh, I discovered junior college after high school, accidentally discovered acting there when it was recommended by a, a cool new buddy of mine. Fell in love with it immediately because it allowed me to access things within myself and between myself and other people that had never been safe. And it really opened up myself and the world to me. Went to New York City, studied for three years at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and was an actor for about nine years between New York Mm. City, L.A., and I lived in Europe for three years. And uh, the whole time I had a burning drive to get an education, and I finally scratched that itch, drove my motorcycle from New York to L.A., Got California residency after a year, went back to school, struggled at first, uh, junior college, got my BA, graduated with honors from the top 10 program at UCLA, and then got my MBA at Purdue University's then top 20 business school, and then became a vice president in GE Capital, uh, doing those deals that you mentioned with CFOs at Fortune 1000, even Fortune 2000 uh, CFOs, doing large deals, alliances, and uh segued a little more into corporate banking and finance from that and then left that and started my own small company that I sold. And now I just speak and train on leadership and on peak performance and peak performance, by the way, is the first half of leadership. Hmm. So everything I train on that, almost everything I train in, in peak performance, I also train in leadership and I do that at UCLA and in the corporate market. Well, I, I just had a thought, and and tell me if this sounds right. Is leadership basically about I've learned how to manage my performance at optimum levels, and I'm here to inspire, motivate, and educate you on how to come to peak performance? Is that how those two concepts fit together? 
Uh, in a nutshell, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, in fact, I'm I'm revamping uh, one of my my leadership seminars now, and I'm going to do a book on that as well as another book on peak performance. And um, there are nine tenets in a in a peak performing leader, and they are the things that that leader develops and nurtures and cultures and exemplifies within themselves and also in other within other people. And I'll, real quickly, I'll throw them out there, and I know you relate to probably all of them. Uh, there, it's what I call the PVC three uh, paradigm. Uh, there are three P's, three V's, and three C's. The let's see, I don't have this in front of me, I, but uh, <laughs> the P's. The first P is presence. It's always presence. Uh, it, that is shown in study after study of peak performance from top peak performance researchers, as well as leadership experts, as being integral and necessary to peak performance and to leadership. So it's presence. The second P is a hybrid or sort of a, a, a duality of uh, passion and purpose. Uh, so it's presence, passion, and purpose, and then personal power. Now, for a lot of leaders, they have a little bit too much of a sense of personal power. <laughs> so it needs to be reined in. But um, <laughs> if they don't have enough of a sense, you know, you want to develop that and nurture it within yourself. And you certainly have to do that within the people you lead. The V's are uh, vision, values, and velocity. Vision, I think, speaks for itself. Uh, we need to know uh, clearly have a clear, passionate, purposeful vision of the great difference we're going to make in life with our gifts, with our skills, with our passions, with other people to affect other people, to help other people, to make an impact and make the world a better place. E even if it's with a better widget to make the world a better place, we have to have a clear, compelling vision. We have to have values that support and in no way hinder that vision. And that's really important. Most people aren't aware of what their values are. And it's Im imperative for a leader to define their individual values that support their life purpose, their mission, the, their vision of that, but also with their people together, define who are we, what are our values. And there should never be more than seven and probably only three to five core values that define uh, eight, you know, the, the Pareto principle, 80, 20 rule. 80% hmm. of who we are, what makes 80% of our success, our difference, our competitive advantage, what's important to us and our um, stakeholders, our customers. Um, velocity, I don't want to go too much into, but that is you want to create a sense of urgency. It's easy to get complacent. Most jobs are boring. It's the same nonsense day after day. <laughs> I remember when I was a corporate banker, my, my older boy one day, he was probably seven, I'll say, or six maybe, and went with me and spent the day with me at the office. And at the end of the day, he said, Dad, they pay you for that? <laughs> and, and I said, yeah, why? He said, what you do is you, you play on the computer and you talk on the phone. They Really? They pay you for that? <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, yeah, they sure do, buddy. A lot of money, actually. And, um, and, and, and uh, so I say to people in seminars, look, the people you lead, your job, in fact, it's 90 to 99% boring, redundant nonsense, the same Day after day, you've got to find the passion and the purpose. Every one of your jobs exists because you serve a need or a want of other people. You've got to find the purpose and passion, and you've got to inflame that within your people. Mm. So veloc velocity identifies that you need to keep create a sense of urgency, keep that sense of urgency, and create systems and structures within your culture and within your daily operating routine that naturally inflame the, our passions and our sense of purpose. Mm, very good. And then the fun, I'm sorry, and I'm rambling on, let me give you final C3s and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll let you talk. I'm sorry. The, 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 the <laughs> oh, it's C's. Good. It's good. Keep it up. <laughs> the C's are um, uh, care. Number one, care. Recognize mo most managers I've met, they're, they're driven, highly focused, ambitious people. And they care about themselves and their lives, as we all do. But they don't always care about their people. And if they do, they don't always show it because they're not comfortable doing it or they feel it's not professional or appropriate or, or, they're, or they're otherwise just not comfortable. But care. Find things about your people that you genuine, genuinely care about and care for. Hmm. Number two is communicate. Everything in life boils down to communication. How we first communicate with ourselves, what, when, and how we communicate with ourselves unconsciously, most important, mm -hmm. and consciously, and what, when, and how we communicate with other people. That's life in a nutshell, communication. And then the, the third C is cultivate. You've got to cultivate yourself. 
and you've got to cultivate your people, and it's got to be a systematic, structured, disciplined, non-negotiable, weekly thing. So anyway, mm. I didn't know we were going to go into that, but uh, <laughs> th- th- I'm sorry. That That's the PVC3. That's very and, that's very good. Very useful and very practical. And yeah, you're right. That does resonate with me on, on every level, especially the communication part, because sure. I'm doing a strategic communication master's degree, and okay. I'm doing that because – I truly believe communication is the whole basis of everything. Yep. Uh, it, it's what drives everything we do. It, it drives our performance as well as our, our self talk. You know, what we, what we say to ourselves. Um, all of this is, is really fascinating to me. And I really want to get into specifically what you're talking about in terms of how this applies to entrepreneurs. You work with, uh, entrepreneurs, with corporations. Um, Tell us, and especially about rebelpreneurs, uh, what is it that that your mind? What, what is it about the mindset of a entrepreneur that we know what needs to be done, but there's something in our our brain, or what is it that mm-hmm. often is a block? It's an obstacle. We self sabotage. Why is our brain working against us all the time? It seems like. Yeah, there are there are two ways that our brains and our minds uh, do work against us, and they work against us all to varying degrees, all and in the same ways and for the same reasons. Number one, uh, it, it's uh, two ways. It's psychological and it's biological. And I'll say neurobiological because it, it appears to be overwhelmingly neurobiological. But the reality is that a mind and communication and brain, even the organ brain, mind is energy. And it flows, it appears, or we tend to think of it flowing only through brain. But studies in neuro um, science show that it flows through the whole and around the whole body, but overwhelmingly within the brain, perhaps. Or at least that's the central organ, or it appears to be the central organ of mind. But uh, so our our limitations are both biological and psychological. The biological ones, it's really important to understand. This is our primary instrument of motivation, of passion, of identifying and following purpose and mission in life. It's our primary organ of communication with ourselves and with other people, and it's working against us. Our brain evolved. They think Homo sapien has been around roughly 300,000 years. With our ancestors, we're talking about millions of years. Our brains evolved as a species over, including our ancestors, millions of years, not for success, happiness, or fulfillment in modern societies, but to do one thing and one thing only, live. Hmm. And then second, to procreate. So in effect, you do continue to live even after you're dead. So our brains evolved as organs, as instruments to do four things that aided in our survival and flourishing for millions of years, several hundred thousand as Homo sapien. Our brains are engineered to naturally and overwhelmingly not focus because a brain that focused 5,000, 500,000 years ago and became too preoccupied with something got eaten Mm. by a bear or a lion. The brain is also, and again, this is neuroscience, mm-hmm. studying the brain has, has determined this. Our brains naturally, naturally seek negatives, not positives. And those negatives are threats. Our brains naturally are seeking threats to run from. Because again, 5,000 and 500,000 years ago, survival meant finding the closest, nearest, most likely threat and getting the heck away and quickly. Mm-hmm. Our brains also naturally seek and take the path of least resistance because that was the most likely path to survival. And our brains naturally, and this is understandable, naturally we have the perspective and the interest of self. We are only living our our lives, so we can't really have someone else's perspective. And our most important mission in life is survival. It's engineered into the brain. Now, that's all understandable, but if you think about it, we in modern society, we want a heck of a lot more than survival. Hmm. We want to thrive. We want fulfillment. We want meaning and we want happiness, right? 
Absolutely. So, so how how do we make that transition from the from the ancient uh, Neanderthal or Homo sapien brain that is only focused on uh, self centeredness and and survival and the path of least resistance? And these are not necessarily traits that come to mind as entrepreneurs or rebelpreneurs. So, how do we? evolve beyond that's probably a good word in the context how do we evolve yeah. beyond just survival to to get the happiness fulfillment and success we want yeah i think uh, we have to look at it uh, both tactically and strategically we need to come up with and this is what i do in my seminars we have to have exercises that are intellectual and emotional and physical to access our old unconscious neurobiological brain to start changing our set point. We all have a set point that is both biological and psychological that comes from our genetics, that comes from our evolution as a species, and that comes from our personal life experiences that have affected us neurobiologically. The, the most important neurochemicals like adrenaline, Adrenaline, responsible for energy. Testosterone, responsible for uh, a level of confidence, but a level of assertiveness and uh, going for things, taking risk. Serotonin, which is responsible for well-being, mind state. And um, uh, dopamine, responsible for uh, moving towards uh, perceived pleasure. Mm. Those things. Oxytocin, responsible for love, trust, bonding. And then we have cortisol, the negative stress hormone that is detrimental to us six peak performing and succeeding in modern society. So recogni recognizing that our brain is both a psychological and biological organ and that it's engineered to work against us both evolutionarily and through the like for my, 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 you know, I grew up in an extremely negative environment, but none of us grew up in a perfect environment. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of psychological and biological baggage. We have set points psychologically and biologically. And for every person to some degree, they work against us. So you want strategic tools that you have to really repeat day after day after day because adult learning science knows some of the most important important principles in actual adult learning and change are it has to be emotionally impactful it has to have great meaning to you it has to be applicable to your life and now and through repetition 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 we can make a change in our subconscious neurobiological brain so you approach it strategically to try to up your biological and psychological set points so let's say Zero is someone who commits suicide and 10 is the, you know, I don't know, maybe a Steve Jobs or the, the highest peak performing of people. Hmm. And let's say we're at a three. So we want to uh, retrain our subconscious biological and mental and psychological brain to up our set point from three to four to five to six as high as we can, but also have tactical tools because, you know, there are going to be days where we're kind of in a funk. Or maybe we've upped our game to where we're at a set point of five, but you know what? We got to be at an eight today because today is so important <laughs> and, and, and we've got to just kick it up some. So then you have tactical tools to up the, the, uh, the, the point, uh, on a more temporary basis, but it's an ongoing dynamic. Um, you know, uh, the, the brain biologically and neurophysiologically is naturally working against us and psychologically because life is complicated and, and no one's life has been perfect. So uh, so that's it. That's yeah. it. Well, that, that really sounds fascinating. Now, you say that most or the, uh, or the vast majority of our personal development intentions and efforts usually fail. And, you know, here, here we are. Coming around to another first of the year where we're going to make resolutions, we're going to set sales targets and different uh, business uh, targets. But most of these intentions fail. Why is that? Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I mean, ha have you ever set an intention, Ralph, and, it, and, and, you, and you had an aha moment and said, oh, my goodness, that's going to work for me. I am going to use that. <laughs> Yeah, all and, the time. <laughs> yeah, and how often do we do that? Or you know, we maybe do it half-heartedly once, and then we forget about it. Hmm. It's because we have not ingrained it into our subconscious neurobiological brain. Um, so that there are two primary reasons, really, that 
the vast, vast majority of individual and organizational attempts at significant change, development, growth, improvement, peak performance, and peak success uh, don't succeed. And the first one is the, either the placebo or nocebo effect, because consciously or subconsciously, we don't think it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And if our subconscious brain, if we try to tell our subconscious brain something it doesn't believe, the subconscious brain is very literal, off and on, off and on. And it's impressed by emotion because emotion tells it, whoa, wake up, pay attention, dude, uh, because 5,000, 500,000 years ago, that meant there was a lion. Hmm. Or a rattlesnake or something. So emotion is a surge of neurochemicals telling the brain, wake up, you're about to die. Act. Mm-hmm. So uh, we need to attack that subconscious neurophysiological brain to retrain it. And if we don't believe it's going to work because we're just a negative person or a jaded person or we've tried it before and it just hasn't worked for us. Or we have that friend that buys all these self-help books and goes to all these <laughs> seminars and nothing ever changes. So, so um, it's not because that person can't change. They just lack the tools uh, to change. They, so the first reason, primary reason that our efforts at self change and organizational change don't work is because of the placebo or nocebo effect. And that's been well studied and document, documented scientifically. If we believe something won't or will work, uh, our, our, our subconscious brain won't take it seriously and it won't work. Mm-hmm. You know, and not, not always, but in the vast majority of times. Mm-hmm. And in fact, studies of drugs by drug companies themselves, they keep this very quiet. They estimate that up to 60 plus percent of the efficacy of drugs in general is due to the placebo effect. Mm. That's and amazing, isn't it? The actual drug itself. Yeah. There have been many famous studies done on this that, that have proven, uh, scientifically proven the placebo and the nocebo effect. Um, and the second uh, reason, and I think this is more common, we think that knowledge plus desire or knowledge plus motivation equals change. So we want to change something. We want a different result. We want to be a different person. We have an aha moment. We read a book or we just have our own aha moment or we listen to your radio show, Ralph, or we go to a great seminar and there's an aha moment and we think this means change. Hmm. And again, it doesn't. Then unconscious neurobiological brain doesn't work that way. Rarely. I mean, if it's, if the change is, um, you know, uh, you touch a hot iron, yes, one time we'll do it <laughs> because that sends that, that highly charged emotional signal to the old brain. Uh, this means death. You, you mm-hmm. touch this object again, it means death. But short of those kind of experiences, that kind of emotional impact, the, the old brain is like, yeah, dude, I'm busy. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you think this is uh, a great idea? Great. I, I couldn't be more happy for you. <laughs> Knock yourself out, champ, because trust me, nothing's changing. So, <laughs> so it, you, your work is along the lines of helping people to optimize their psychology and their neurobiology for peak mindset, motivation, behaviors, skills, and success. How do people get in touch with you? How do they tap into this? Because it sounds like we need to rewire our brain. If we ever want to try and achieve our goals, we've got to go about it in a different way than what we're used to going about it. Yeah, well, and there's a chance people have done this. I mean, we many of us have done this without knowing we have done it, you know, just serendipitously. I quit smoking when I was 21, 22. It's the easiest thing I ever did. Hmm. I, I didn't know what I was doing to my unconscious brain. I know now. I recognize it now. But it's the easiest thing. I never struggled for a nanosecond since then. So it's not that people can't do this. People do sometimes do this serendipitously, um, but they don't know what they're doing. The thing is, we there are tools we can adopt so that we can consciously do this in pretty much any time we want to, hmm. um, if we're committed to it. So, if, yeah, if somebody wants to reach me, uh, my business is Peak Performance Leadership, but I really never use that. Uh, reach out to me at ChristopherBabson.com, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R. And the last name is like Babson. Is it college? Yeah, the, it's economics college in 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 um, in Boston area. It's actually it was a relative of mine, but oh. um, I can't remember if it's Babson College or University. No, it's Babson College. It's a it's a top um, economics college. But uh, oh, okay. But um, it's it's spelled like Babson College. If you you forget, uh, look just look up Babson. B is in boy. A is in apple. B is in boy. S O N is in nice. 
So it's ChristopherBabson.com. And uh, you can find me there and, and just uh, reach out to me through my website. I'd love to hear from you. Very good. Well, th- this has been very educational, uh, very motivational, and I, I appreciate you sharing your, your wisdom with us. Christopher Babson is a an author and a teacher and a speaker on the topics of leadership and peak performance. Find out more by contacting him at Christopher Babson. Dot com. Chris, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for your time, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Ralph. I appreciate it, too. You've been listening to Rebelpreneur Radio with Ralph Brogdon. Download the show notes and much more at rebelpreneur.com.